we have a real privilege of um, welcoming Desi Lynx, who's one of our plastic surgery um, fellow, um, one of our plastic surgery uh, colleagues and friends, and I'm very well known to our department. Um, she's going to talk to us about uh, low lip reconstruction. Uh, we're very excited to hear from her. The last talk was excellent, um, and always it's such a pleasure to have her. Um, I just want to, she had a, she just had to restart a computer, so we'll just give her the opportunity just to share her screen and uh, just make sure that everything's working well. Destiny, uh, do you want to just share your screen? That looks beautiful. Okay, fantastic. So Thanks. Destiny, <laughs> whenever you're ready, you can just say hi and uh, you're welcome to start. Okay, thank you, Louisa, and thank you to the ENT team. Um, uh, thank you for the opportunity to present this talk. Uh, if you should hear some barking in the background, um, I've got a little dog who always thinks somebody's breaking into my house. So he's just trying to protect me. <clears throat> so my talk this morning is on total lower lip reconstruction. Um, I am Destiny and um, yeah, let's, let's go. So this slide, I want to just um, point out about the the anatomy of the upper and the lower lip. And um, with the lower lip reconstruction, the lower lip con is, consists of only one subunit, right? It's one um, complete structure. Where the upper lip is a bit more difficult, it's got two lateral subunits and a medial subunit, which makes it more difficult to reconstruct in theory. But there are also very important functions to the lower lip that can make it difficult to reconstruct. Important principles about reconstruction for us is that we have to replace like with like. In that sense, always try and look for um, structures around the defect that you can use to reconstruct your defect, because it's most, most likely to be of similar quality skin and similar color match as well. Oral competence depends significantly on, the, on a good lower lip reconstruction. Um, so the lower lip needs to have good muscular function. It also <laughs> needs to have adequate height and um, also needs to have um, be sensate. Um, and then also our aim is to resource, restore symmetry and also um, to give a normal appearance to the lip. So the, uh, the index case that brought this talk along was uh, this gentleman that is well known to our um, head and neck team um, that we reconstructed last year. He presented with this, this massive lower lip SEC, which also extended onto his chin subunit. You can see it extended onto his left um, commissure, into the right commissure. And then there's this area of ulceration on the upper lip which was either like an area of pressure or was definitely also tumor. We also did uh, imaging for this patient. And as you can see, this gentleman is um, edentulous, which makes uh, his mandible height an issue. And like I said, that the, the lower lip needs to have, um, there needs to also be height um, to the lower lip in order to ensure uh, good oral competence. So we then went ahead, um, the plastic surgery team and the head and neck team, and we did a resection of this tumor, quite a significant defect. You can see there's a um, mandible that's protruding in that wound. Um, extension went all the excision, incision went all the way up to the upper lip. Um, and you can see from the one commissure to the other commissure. So very, very um, large defect. And so we have to think about how are we going to reconstruct this? And considerations with reconstructing the lower lip is, are you going to do a functional or you're going to do a non-functional reconstruction? And I will talk about the different options a bit later. Also looking at, do you have local options you can use? Is there something in the region of the head and neck you can use, or do you definitely have to use a, a distant option like a free flap? And then in this case, also consider the bony deficiency um, that this mandible has. There's a, a vertical height discrepancy. In this gentleman's case, we then opted to do a double flap reconstruction. 
uh, we did a free fibula flap, which you took from the right lower leg. And this was to address the bony deficiency and, and provide support to the lower lip. Um, <clears throat> should you think about doing a free bone graft or plate only, there's a high risk of having osteoradionecrosis and extrusion of the plate because this patient is definitely going to need radiation therapy. Um, a vascularized flap, like we do with free fibula flaps, they, they, they can withstand uh, radiation treatment better than doing a free bone graft or only inserting a plate. And then um, with the edentulous mandible, there is poor support for the lip. Um, plus, we also did a marginal mandibulectomy in this patient's case. So then we went ahead and we also harvested an anterior lateral thigh flap from the left side. Um, and this was to compensate for the large soft tissue defect. Uh, what was um, uh, good in this patient is that he was quite a thin patient. So his thigh was not um, a very thick layer of fat. Um, and, this, and, and in this case, it also allowed us to work at the same time as the head and neck team while we harvested our flap. Um, we we very lucky we have very skilled microvascular surgeons in our department, so we are able to do like two free flaps in one day. And this was the initial outcome of um, of the gentleman, uh, which I think is not. Uh, I think in in the setting of the defect, we actually got a really good outcome. We got lots of bulk on that lower lip, um, and we got the height um, well. Um, we also ended up reconstructing the upper lip with a um, facial artery myocutaneous flap. So getting back to total lower lip reconstruction and looking at the functional versus non-functional reconstructions, um, if you look at local options, you have um, a car carapantic, which is a functional reconstruction. There's the Bernard Webster and the Fujimori, uh, which is for total um, the carapanzic is for more of, of like a two-thirds uh, defect. Bernard Webster and Fujimori, they for total lower lip reconstruction in the setting where you can't uh, do other um, options. And they are, um, the Bernard Webster is a functional, uh, non-functional reconstruction and the Fujimori is a functional reconstruction. And then there are other regional and distant options and I will speak about some of them in the slides. So firstly, looking at the carapanzic, um, this is a first uh, one stage reconstruction for typically described central lip defects. It's a sensate reconstruction because you use the tissue around the, the, the upper lip um, and the commissures and you recruit that to reconstruct the lower lip and typically described for defects up to two thirds of the lower lip, but can be done in larger defects if your patient anatomy allows it, meaning does your patient have enough laxity in that area that you can recruit enough uh, to reconstruct the lower lip. Um, the, the outcome of this lip uh, reconstruction is that it is sensate, which is great and is competent because you keep your commissures intact, um, but they do have microsomia. And this is an example of a patient that also had a, a SEC of his lower lip. You can see where we excise the tumor. Um, this was him about a week post-op and this was him about three months post-op back in the clinic. Um, great, I think it's a great recon, um, reconstructive option for this patient. And as you can see, there's already change in the size of the mouth from the initial stage um, to about three months later. So they do stretch over time. Another functional reconstruction is an innovated gracilis free flap. This is well described in the literature. Um, it's a functional and an aesthetic reconstruction. You use the branch of the obturator nerve and you then anastomose that to the marginal mandibular nerve to give um, function to the lip. Um, you also suture the gracilis muscle to your residual orbicularis muscle and that reconstructs the, the sphincter component of your lip. You then cover that with a split thickness skin graft. And then for your mucosa layer, you can use a facial artery myocutaneous flap. In our unit, we've also used the innovative vastus lateralis flap. It's not currently described in the literature, 
um, and it's only done by one of our microvascular surgeons, you, you harvest this flap via the same incision as an ALT. Uh, you use the descending branch of the lateral circumflex femoral artery and the vena comitantes like you would, you would use in the ALT. And you, there's an accompanying nerve that you then harvest and co-apt to your marginal mandibular nerve. So far, we've done four in our unit. The last one was done in 2020. And um, I just heard recently that the article was accepted for publication. And this was one of the gentlemen we did a bustus lateralis on. Uh, we, the same concept as the gracilis, harvested the muscle with the nerve, with um, artery and, and vein, and then, in, and then put a, a skin graft on top of it. So these little black spots, that's part of the skin graft that's um, not viable, but this general pink area, that's all viable skin graft and, and um, muscle that's intact. So moving on to non-functional reconstruction, Bernard von Barrow-Webster. This is also one stage insensate reconstruction and mostly restricted to the elderly because you need a lot of laxity to recruit tissue from the cheek area um, and recreate your lower lip. Um, the, the Barrow's triangles, that's where the von Barrow area um, concept comes in is it's standing cutaneous deformities or what we would call in in day-to-day -day language, um, a dog ear that will be excised with um, with the uh, the incisions to reconstruct, um, and then again you can reconstruct your vermilion by using like a facial artery, mycotaneous flap, or buccal flap to reconstruct your mucosal lining. Uh, this incision was just that the patient had a, another tumor preauricular, and uh, we excised that tumor at the same setting as well. The Fujimori, or called the gate flap, this is a modification of a laser labial flap. Um, and you can use up to three centimeters um, in the, uh, you can increase up to three centimeters in the length um, if you extend your incision below the commissure. So if you make your incision in the nasal labial fold up to the commissure, if you want to gain more length, you can go past the commissure and then um, have more length to reconstruct your lip. The mucosal flaps is also designed to reconstruct the red vermilion, um, and that's on the dotted lines, okay? So you do, on the inside of the mouth, you get, get some mucosa, and you incise that as well in a similar fashion as the skin incisions. And this flap contains innervated muscle, because you take muscle from that nasolabial fold. Um, not very familiar with this um, form of reconstruction, um, but it is a well-described uh, method. Another non-functional reconstruction is a deltopectoral flap. This is a fascia cutaneous flap. This is a regional reconstruction, and it's based on perforators from the second and the third intercostal space, um, and it comes from your internal mammary artery. Uh, those perforators are quite large, and they they give excellent blood supply to this, the delta pectoral flap. Um, the flap can be safely harvested with a width of up to 10 centimeters um, and you can still close your donor site primarily. Uh, you can also extend your flap up to your delta pectoral groove. If you need it longer, then you will have to delay the flap. It's a nice thin and pliable reconstruction, but unfortunately it's not functional. It's not sensate. Uh, and it's, it's got very little bulk. If you choose this, this flap, you still can use your, your pectoralis major flap for backup. Your pectoralis major flap, that is your, um, class we classify my five muscle flaps under types one to five. This is a type five methods and a high muscle flap. And, and typically it's the salvage flap of the head and, neck, um, head and neck surgery. It's got major blood supply coming from the pectoral branch of the thoracochromial artery, and then has minor supplies coming from the branches of the internal mammary and um, branches from the long thoracic artery. It can be used as a pedicled flap. Um, the skin island you can harvest with the muscle. Does it have a great color match to the face? Um, 
often not because most people have their, their thorax covered most of their life um, and their faces are more exposed to sun so the color match isn't great there's always a concern also for displacement of the nipple um, and also it can in the females it can give a contour deformity to the breast uh, you can gain length um, if you pass the flap behind the clavicle. Okay, now the non-functional reconstruction is a supraclavicular flap. This is a fascicular tennis flap. It's based on a supraclavicular artery. Um, it can be harvested with primary closure of the donor site. Uh, the source vessel comes from a triangle between the sternocleidomastoid, the trapezius posterior, and the clavicle inferior. The branch comes off the transfer cervical artery or sometimes comes off the subclavian artery directly. The flap is based on an area above the clavicle and it can extend up to the mid deltoid. It's a very versatile flap for the head and neck area. <clears throat> I've done quite a few myself. And the neck section usually doesn't disrupt your blood supply. So this is one of my patients um, that, so this area here, is a previous big major flap that we did for him. He's, um, he's got osteoradionecrosis, very difficult wound healing, um, has had multiple debridements of his bone, has had um, scans to check for viability of the bone. The bone is viable, um, but just not getting wound healing in that area. And um, I subsequently did a Stenocleidomast, uh, a supraclavicular flap for him to, to close that defect. So this was my markings. Um, this little cross here, that's the uh, clavicular-chromio joint. And that is where my pedicle is coming in. And as you can see, um, this is the, the furthest extension of my flap. It, this, this can be closed primarily as you can see there. So he had a bit of distal tip necrosis, um, which wasn't the full thickness necrosis. Um, this was another use of a, a supraclavicular flap, also a gentleman well known to the ENT um, head and neck team. Um, and then this lady also reconstruction we did last year, she presented with cancrum or Oris, or what we otherwise called Noma. Um, and she had a pedicles reconstruction. So you can see that the flap is still attached. We made a little sausage for her and she had a subsequent division of that flap. But also she's young, she's, in, she's like 20 years old. So even in that case, you can still close that uh, defect um, or the donor site primarily. Anterolateral thigh flap, this is another fasciocutaneous flap. This is now moving into free flap territory. Um, this has minimal donor site morbidity. It's based on perforators coming from the descending branch of your lateral circumflex femoral artery. And um, most of the perforators are usually musculocutaneous. So meaning the perforator comes from the source blood vessel through the muscle. So through the vastus lateralis most of the time. Um, which makes the, the, the section quite challenging. The flap, uh, flaps, you can harvest up to 10 by 25 centimeters and still get primary closure. Um, problem with the anterolateral thigh, thigh flap is that in, in patients with large thighs, the bulk of the flap can be a problem. That can be addressed later with debulking procedures, but in the initial setting, it can be difficult to contour. And um, you can also harvest this flap with fascia lata and, and provide kind of like a, a support for the lower lip. The radial form free flap, this is the, what, you know, this is the exam textbook answer for free flap uh, reconstruction of the lower lip. Um, you, you include the palmaris longus tendon for support. If, if the patient doesn't have a palmaris longus tendon, which um, some people don't have, uh, I have used 
part of the uh, flexor uh, radial uh, carpi radialis before. Um, so I've done a strip of the of the FCR and included that in the flap, but um, typically described for palmaris longus use. Uh, it's a also a fascia cutaneous flap and it's supplied by the radial artery. Uh, you can also innovate it by using the lateral antibrachial cutaneous nerve to provide sensation to the flap. Performing an Allen's test prior to the harvest of the flap, that is still the, the answer you give in the exams before you harvest this flap, but mostly um, it, most micro microvascular surgeons don't do it. It's got such a reliable blood supply. Um, the, most of the perforators from, for this flap comes um, out in the distal half of the forearm. The average flap size can be eight by 10 centimeters large. And if you want to include um, bone in the flap, just remember there's a high risk of having fracture of that, of that um, rigid, residual bone. Um, the flap harvest is quick. Um, you can work as two teams since you are out of the, out of the um, working field of your head and neck team. It has a very reliable blood supply um, and they generally have a good post-op recovery, but cosmetic outcome is, is quite poor with regards to your donor site. It's an unsightly scar. Um, it, yeah, it, it, it doesn't look good. <laughs> so before we end off, um, think about functional reconstruction. That's always the goal for the lower lip and then always replace like with like. So think about local options rather than, than uh, regional options rather than free flap options. Thank you very much. Awesome, Destiny, thanks so much. That was really concise and really helpful. Um, I don't know if there's any questions from the floor or um, any questions from uh, people listening in or any comments from the team. Disney, thank you very much. You know, to say that we're really fortunate to have, have such a good reconstructive team that, you know, that, that brings in lots of options. And, uh, you know, and I think having options is the importance, you know, to you know, adapt uh, your choice of flat, uh, both the defect and the patient. Uh, but thank you very much for that. Thank you, Prof. Thank you. Thanks, Prof. Are there any, um, any other questions or comments or other people's experiences? Okay, I don't see any further comments. Um, Destiny, thank you so much for your time this morning. Thank you for the great presentation. Uh, always lovely to hear from you. Um, and uh, you've got a, I'm sure your dog is very cute. We didn't get to see your dog, but... Uh, <laughs> um, thank you, Louisa. Thank you for the opportunity. <laughs> sure. So um, without further ado, I think I'm going to start ending the meeting. It doesn't seem that there are any more questions. Thanks, everyone, for joining. We'll see you next week. Thank you. Bye.